Uh, my name is Jay Shamba. I'm the director of the Institute for International Economic Policy here at GW. So welcome virtually to Washington, DC. Um, uh, we're really thrilled today to be hosting this event on campaign finance and the wealth of politicians in our Facing Inequality series. Uh, and so we're, we're gonna jump right to that first, just for those of you who maybe don't know much about IEP, let me just say quickly, we're a kind of cross-school interdisciplinary research group here at George Washington University. We focus on kind of all things related to policy, related to economic globalization and the global economy. And so that can include anything from international finance, international trade, international development, or realistically um, economic policy more broadly. We focus a lot on issues around inequality in, in this series on facing inequality, also do a lot on India's economy and China's economy as well as a number of other series. Um, we've been pretty active over the last year in kind of a virtual space and all of those events are recorded and available on either our YouTube channel or on our website, you can find them either place. So um, if this is interesting to you and you wanna go back and find older episodes, there are plenty, plenty to see. Um, we have uh, one more episode this month, uh, uh, not in this series, but one more seminar um, on Thursday at noon. Um, if for those of you interested in food systems, um, which I think it's actually going to be a pretty interesting event as well. Um, so without uh, too much more ado, let me turn it over now to Trevor Jackson, uh, who has been helping to organize and run the Facing Inequality series this year and has, has put out some terrific uh, seminars here. And so uh, let me turn it over to Trevor to uh, welcome everyone again and uh, explain the series and what today's event will be. Well, thank you, Jay, for that kind introduction. Um, so it's my happy task to introduce what we're all doing here and to introduce our speakers. Uh, so the Facing Inequality series began in the before times um, as a interdisciplinary seminar funded by the GW uh, Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. And it came out of a conversation between myself and Brian Stewart of the GW Economics Department, who is now on his way to take up a job at the Philadelphia Fed. And usually conversations between historians and economists hinge on what we don't agree about. Uh, but we would rapidly realize that inequality was one subject uh, on which we might be able to learn from each other and have some productive conversations. And even then inequality had clearly been emerging uh, as one of the key areas of both policy and academic research. And that's only been intensified by the COVID-19 pandemic. So once the pandemic began, uh, the seminar series moved online and became Facing Inequality, hosted by our friends at IIEP. Uh, and Facing Inequality brings together historians, economists, sociologists, political scientists, and epidemiologists from within the academy and without to present cutting edge work, to discuss their ideas, and essentially to try to facilitate a new interdisciplinary dialogue, uh, new ways of talking about and researching the problem of inequality. So uh, we have had, I believe, 11 events um, we are easily Googleable, and I would urge you to do that to see what the range of past events have been like. We have had talks on everything ranging from environmental inequality in modern India to the impact of COVID-19 on gender inequality in the U.S. to wage inequality among builders in 17th century London. Um, when I say that we are interdisciplinary, we really mean it. Uh, so today we are very happy to welcome Mark, Marco Klasnia, who is an assistant professor at Georgetown University. Uh, he has a joint appointment in the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service, as well as the government department. And he has his PhD in political science from NYU. Um, he's also been a visiting scholar at Princeton. And his research focuses on democratic accountability and inequalities in political representation, with a special focus on electoral fortunes of corrupt politicians. Um, he also teaches on comparative political economy and quantitative research methods. As our discussants, uh, we have Nina Eihacker, who is an assistant professor of economics at the University of Rhode Island and has her PhD from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. She synthesizes post-Keynesian economic theory and international political economy to better understand the effects of globalization, financial liberalization, and public intervention in the neoliberal economy. She is also the author of Financial Underpinnings of the European Crisis, Financial Deregulation, Privatization, and Asymmetric State Power out from 2017. Uh, and joining her as our discussant is Tim Schenk, uh, one of the newest members of my own history department here at GW. 
He is a historian of the modern United States with a particular focus on the intersections of political and intellectual history. Uh, he is the author of an intellectual biography of the Cambridge economist Maurice Dobb uh, from Paul Gray Macmillan in 2013, and is currently working on not one, but two books, one based on his dissertation and coming out from Princeton University Press on the idea of the economy uh, as it emerged in the United States in the 20th century, and the other an intellectual history of the American political elite from the Constitution down to Donald Trump. Uh, and that is under contract with Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. So I think that we will turn over now to Marco, who will speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll turn to our discussants and have some time for conversation at the end. So with no further ado for me, Marco, take it away. All right. Um, thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, James, uh, for, for having me. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Nina and Tim in advance for, uh, for the comment. It's really great to have um, you know, comments not just from uh, the likes of myself and my co-authors, uh, who are we're all political scientists, but also you know to hear some perspectives from you know other disciplines. Um, and it's great to uh, to be in this venue. I've uh, participated in uh, seminars and watched them online, um, and so I'm really you know proud and uh, and happy to uh, to be uh, a part of it. Um, all right, let me share slides, um, and then uh, we'll get going. Um, all right, so this is, um, um, so I'm going to be talking to you about the kind of relationship between campaign finance rules um, and the wealth of uh, politicians. Uh, and by politicians, um, I'll also sort of describe what, uh, what I mean in, uh, in particular. And so this is joint work with um, Lucia uh, Mozzolini, who I think is in the audience. So um, a shout out to, uh, to Lucia, uh, who is at NYU, uh, although she will be joining um, Washington St. Louis, um, University of Washington St. Louis. Uh, and Simon Wesley, who is, um, who is at Syracuse. And as I said, we are uh, with sort of three uh, political scientists, uh, assistant professors. All right, so um, I want to sort of spend a few uh, minutes on kind of the motivation and the background um, for, for this work. Um, so as probably all of you in the audience know, um, you know, politicians in the United States are much wealthier than uh, the citizens and the population that they represent. So this graph here, uh, is part of another uh, project uh, on politician, for the politician wealth that I have done with uh, Andy Eggers, who is um, a professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, the kind of traces um, a little bit more precisely than what's been kind of out there already through venues like uh, the Center for Responsive Politics uh, as to sort of how wealthy um, the politicians in the United States really are. And so this is data from uh, the members of the House of Representatives. And so what it shows kind of at the top part of the graph is the share of millionaires in both parties. So in red is Republicans and blue is uh, the Democrats among members of the House. And then the kind of bottom two lines are the um, uh, 10 millionaires. So these are defined as uh, politicians who have 10 million in gross assets. Um, and so these include real estate, financial assets, and so forth. And so what you see there is here is that about two thirds of members of both parties um, are millionaires in the House. By the way, in the Senate, it's, uh, it's even more pronounced. So basically, almost every uh, senator is um, is a millionaire. Uh, these based on the measures that we were able to uh, put together. Uh, and so, when you contrast this to the population, our best estimates suggest that there's about five to six percent of millionaires uh, in the U.S. population. So you have two thirds members of the House and 100 percent senators who are millionaires against about six to seven percent uh, of um, um, members um, in the population. And so that's a pretty stark, even if it's a uh, well-known finding, sort of, you know, as kind of an aside, what you see is that the wealth of millionaires, this is uh, wealth in real dollars, uh, has steadily gone up. And so we have, uh, we, we seem to have, um, um, you know, richer and richer political elites um, in the United States. And of course, you know, if we look at the, uh, the previous administration, it has been one of the richest um, uh, in history. And, um, you know, the historians in the room can probably tell us uh, if this is um, you know, uh, you know, an outlier or, or, or a trend. Um, now, one of the things that we want to do in the in this project, uh, I'm going to kind of briefly comment on that, but not talk too much about it uh, today, uh, is to kind of look at what's happening elsewhere uh, and kind of put the U.S. in perspective. And so, this is something that we are really sort of proud and want to contribute to because there's not a there's not a systematic data out there to uh, to tell us whether the situation that we see in the United States um, is Kind of replicated in other countries, and so of course there's a you know a variety of individual um, examples. So I've um, kind of put four um, here of really wealthy politicians. Um, so for example, Sebastián Sebastián Piñera, who's the current uh, president of Chile, uh, is has about three billion um, in, in in wealth uh, as uh, estimated by Forbes. 
you know, um, Bejina Ivanishvili, the former prime minister of Georgia, you know, Manuel Villar, who's um, the former speaker of the house um, in the Philippines, all the way to, um, you know, Suleiman Kerimov, um, who's the senator, he's the uh, member of the, uh, the Council of Federation, which is the upper, upper house uh, body in, in Russia, who is uh, estimated to be worth about 20, um, 20 million in net assets. Right? Now, one of the questions that, again, we're going to try and answer is, is this, Something that's widespread. Do other countries look like the United States in terms of the uh, the wealth of politicians relative to the wealth of the population they represent, or how much variation there is and what it might be uh, might be driven by? Now, one of the reasons we think this is important is because there is an emerging literature, mostly in the United States, uh, done mostly by political scientists and economists, that looks at kind of the sort of causes and consequences of wealth. Uh, for political representation. This is something that uh, we are trying to contribute to. And so this is a, a graph from a book by Larry Bartels, a very well-known political scientist. Um, his book is called Unequal Democracy, which kind of looks at, you know, what are politicians doing um, in, in office and who are they responding to? I just have a fire alarm going off, uh, but hopefully it's going to, it's going to stop. And um, and so this graph, what it shows is basically a measure of responsiveness. I'm not going to explain what it is, but it's basically a measure of responsiveness to constituencies of different income levels. And so what the graph is clearly showing is that in the House and particularly in the Senate, politicians, so senator and Congress people, um, senators and congresspersons, seem to be much more responsive to, to preferences of high income individuals and low income individuals. Okay? And so this is something that's been sort of shown over and over again. Uh, in different studies, there's a little bit of a debate whether this is real, uh, but what seems to be the conclusion is when the preferences of the, of the high income constituents differ from the preferences of middle or low income uh, constituents, the high income constituents uh, win. Now, one open question, which we're going to kind of try and indirectly contribute to, we're not going to answer that question directly, is why is this the case? Um, is this the case because Politicians are wealthy themselves, and so they hold preferences similar to other high-income individuals who are not politicians, and therefore responsiveness looks to be because of the similarity of preferences, or is it because the high-income individuals are capturing the political elites who would otherwise be responding to, uh, to, to middle-income and poor uh, or low-income um, uh, voters just as much? And so I've, I've done a little bit of work in that area, too, and so this graph is from another project, co-authored project, that I have done um, surveying individuals, high wealth individuals in the United States. So this is just a, a kind of a brief motivation. I'm not going to sort of explain this too much. But what we've done is we conducted an experiment trying to see how much individuals would be willing to redistribute earnings between two actual workers if the earnings were determined either by luck or by effort. And so what we found is that the red bars are the top five, so this is the really wealthy individuals, and what we found is that they were much more inclined to have what are called a libertarian redistribution preferences, which is basically that they were disinclined to redistribute any earnings that have been determined by luck. So they were much more inclined to be like that than uh, the less wealthy individuals, and they were much less inclined on the, on the left to be egalitarian, meaning that they were... Um, less likely to redistribute even uh, to redistribute from a worker who put in more effort and therefore uh, accrued more earnings. And just as an aside, what you see here is that the, the, the tallest bars here are the meritocratic bars. So this is all in the United States, which is probably doesn't come as a surprise that most people in the United States have meritocratic preferences, meaning that they're reluctant to redistribute from those who earn it by effort, and they're more inclined to redistribute when the uh, earnings are determined by luck. But what we see is that the wealthy seem to be even less, more disinclined to redistribute even those earnings uh, when they come due to us. Uh, and so this is kind of a background as to why having wealthy or less wealthy politicians might matter. It might be that they are less inclined to support redistribution than the less wealthy politician. And it might also be that they're more responsive to or at least more similar to, uh, to in terms of preferences to, uh, to high income individuals, which would, of course, potentially slam um, the uh, public policy outcomes towards those who, uh, who are wealthy, which is obviously part of a, um, you know, an important discussion uh, in the United States and elsewhere. And so what we want to do um, to contribute to this debate, what we want to do in this project is to talk about or try to think about when and why we have wealthy political elites as opposed to less wealthy political elites relative to uh, the, uh, the population. 
Okay. And in this project, what we're going to ask is a very simple and kind of, in some, some sense, basic question, which is how much does a campaign finance system or rules, campaign finance rules, contribute to a political elite that is more uh, or less wealthy? And so this is a project where we're not really sort of building the new theoretical argument that um, can then be you know, discussed. This is really a project that's going to take kind of theory as given and then try to contribute new data uh, to provide answers to, uh, to those theories. And so how do we think um, of rules, uh, campaign finance rules, relate to politician wealth? So I think the arguments are pretty simple. So we think that permissive rules advantage the wealthy. So what do we mean by permissive rules? Well, we mean rules that essentially give either the ability to candidates for political office to finance themselves or have a lot of room to do so, or there's a lot of room for the role of money in politics. And so I'll be more concrete when we get to the data, but essentially we're thinking about systems not unlike the U.S. system where there's a lot of room for spending, there's a fair amount of money in politics, and the role of the state in terms of public subsidies for, for campaign finances is rather limited. And now obviously there's variation across states in the United States, but in general, the system for federal elections and then also for elections in a lot of states uh, is something that could be uh, considered permissive. And again, I'm going to be more concrete uh, when we come to uh, analyze the data. And so we think that those types of permissive uh, systems are likely to advantage um, uh, wealthy uh, in terms of uh, running for office. And so the first and most direct and most straightforward ch channel through which um, uh, such systems may advantage the wealthy is through own spending. Right? So systems that allow uh, candidates to finance their own campaigns or to you know, loan money to their campaigns as it's done in the United States uh, should you know, most directly advantage uh, those who have deeper pockets. Now, in work that I have done in the United States, we have found at least correlations between wealth of politicians and the connections that have, they have to donors. And again, this is something that is pretty straightforward and intuitive, which is that wealthy politicians tend to have you know, deeper networks and more widespread networks uh, with uh, potential donors, particularly deep pocketed donors. And so they have, you know, either find it easier to, to fundraise or they, the parties that um, these candidates represent don't, uh, you know, have to invest as much effort to, um, uh, to get donors to, um, uh, to donate. And so, you know, if there is a lot of money in politics, to the extent that wealthy individuals have advantage in terms of um, um, getting donations and contributions uh, from individuals and corporations, then that's going to advantage um, the wealthy as well. There has been work, sort of historical as well as uh, recent work in the United States that has shown that um, more money in politics usually leads to less competition. It's nothing less political competition. It's nothing else because it's sort of raising the barrier um, of entry um, to uh, less wealthy politicians and also in uh, parties in, in, in countries where uh, we have multi-party systems with more than two parties, it also tends to, uh, to disadvantage certain types of parties. So parties on the left that uh, tend to represent uh, interests that are not necessarily um, uh, friendly to, uh, to, uh, to, to big money um, interests. And then finally, kind of as accumulation of these other channels, what has been found, for example, is, uh, by, by our co-author, Simon Wesley, um, is that um, more permissive rules tend to prolong tenure of existing elites. And so to the extent, you know, usually at least, uh, you know, Simon's work has shown that Citizens United, for example, has decreased the attractiveness of outside options. So when you have more avenues and more ways in which you can raise money for political office, the attractiveness of staying in that office um, is increases relative to, um, um, to you know, things like going to, um, um, to work for, for lobby interests. Uh, and so to the extent that the, the elites are already wealthy, to the extent that their tenure is prolonged, there's going to be less of a turnover and less of a chance for less wealthy politicians to, to enter the game. So these are kind of overall the channels that we consider as likely to, uh, uh, to, to be connecting uh, permissive rules to, uh, to the wealthy politicians. And so what we want to do is we want to try and test these um, um, you know, the, this sort of relationship um, um, in the data. And so here is kind of a kind of a plausibility test. You probably don't need a plausibility test, but nonetheless, um, this is data from um, this uh, project that I mentioned uh, done in the United States, which in the graph, um, the x-axis is the uh, wealth of members of the House um, of Representatives in the United States, and on the y-axis is the own uh, spending, uh, on, you know, own spending on a campaign. So what you see is that there's a very clear positive relationship between wealth um, and spending. In fact, this was by far the strongest relationship in the data where basically, um, you know, 
members of the House who are in the top 5% of all members of the House were spending about 10 times as much on their own campaign as, um, as uh, sort of a median member of the House. So there's a very clear relationship where, uh, you know, money definitely helps uh, the self-financing of campaigns. And so the first way in which we want to try and answer this question, and a novel way that we're contributing in this project, is to collect the data across the world. So it's difficult to generalize from the U.S. system for a number of reasons. One is it's difficult to establish causality in the U.S. alone, but it's also, you know, the U.S. system is very particular. For example, the role of independent expenditure in the United States is something that's, you know, very rarely replicated in other countries. So this is something that's, you know, quite pretty particular to the United States. And so we think that it's productive to go, you know, kind of more broadly and look at the relationship between uh, campaign finance systems and wealth. Um, in, a, in, a, in a larger cross-section of countries. And so the kind of main barrier to doing something like this is that there is no, uh, up to this point, there was no data on uh, politician wealth um, across, uh, across the world. And so this is something that um, uh, me and my co-authors have, uh, have taken upon ourselves to do. Um, and so we are collecting data from, uh, ultimately we want to collect data from about 40 countries, in, in, in particular 42 countries around the world. Um, right now, uh, what I'm going to be showing you is the results from, uh, with data from 19 countries. And so we are basically getting data, information from mandatory and publicly available financial disclosures uh, submitted by members of parliament uh, and members of the executive uh, in these countries. Um, and so these, there's a wide variety of systems, and so I could spend the whole talk just talking about, uh, you know, these data, uh, but we're going to set that aside um, either for Q&A or uh, I'm happy to talk um, uh, to others offline. And I'm sure that um, you know, Nina and team are going to have some questions and some comments about that. But basically, you know, the kind of modal financial disclosure contains information about immovable assets, so real estate and land owned by the politician and usually their household. Um, movable assets like vehicles, agricultural equipment, um, boats, airplanes, and so on. And then financial assets, so this is both cash and deposits, but also stocks and bonds, um, and so on. Um, and then liabilities, so basically debt uh, incurred by, uh, by the politicians or, or their households. And in some cases, uh, disclosures also contain income, uh, both wage income um, and also income, you know, capital gains, and, uh, et cetera. And so, as you can imagine, there's a you know, a lot of variation in sort of what exactly is reported, how it is reported, when, how frequently it's reported, who reports it, um, and then more, more importantly, perhaps, there's also variation in how much checking is going on of the accuracy of the data, what are the penalties for failure to disclose or for uh, false disclosures, what is the ability of politicians to hide assets with, you know, their mother-in-laws or, um, or what have you. Um, obviously, these are things also uh, vary by country. I'm not going to talk about that too much. Um, there are sort of real issues and, and questions about um, these these things. And you know, in, as we're in the process of cleaning and collecting the data, we are we're trying to uh, assess those. But these are obviously things that you should you should keep in mind. So you know, some of these results are going to come with, uh, with uh, obviously with a grain of salt. And so this is the. Um, a uh, sample of countries that we're going to draw on in this particular analysis that I'm going to be uh, showing you today. Um, as I said, there's more countries coming. Uh, Lucia and I are sort of, you know, hard at work at uh, collecting more data. By the way, this has been a kind of a bear of a data collection, as also some of the uh, the previous presenters have uh, have um, also shown some incredible data that has uh, taken a long time to uh, to collect. And so this is uh, this is definitely one of uh, another one of such uh, such projects. That, you know, we've been collecting these data for a good part of for the last five years. Okay, and so just a little bit of a kind of sense uh, for the data before before we dive into into some of the results. So this graph is showing the ratio of politician wealth to average household wealth in each country. Um, and so average household wealth is just one data point, and then the bars here is the kind of distribution of politician wealth relative to that point. And uh, the household data are coming from Credit Suisse, which is a uh, private uh, provider of, kind of estimates of household data. And um, we wish we had better data, but um, uh, it's difficult to get uh, really good data on our average household wealth, uh, as, um, as sort of weird as it, as it sounds. And so one, of the, one thing that I want you to kind of immediately see is the reason why there are two panels um, of in, in this graph is that the lower panel, the five Asian countries, the East and Southeast Asian countries, have such, so, such rich elites relative to the um, citizens they represent is that 
the ratios have to be on a different scale. So as you can see, the ratio on the, in the bottom or the scale on the, in the bottom is, uh, is considerably uh, wider uh, than the scale uh, in the top panel, right? So for example, if you, if you look at Pakistan, the, the sort of white vertical line in the middle of that, of that bar is the median politician uh, in, in Pakistan. And so that median politician is about, I think it was 38 times um, uh, wealthier than the average uh, household. Um, and, and when I say politician, I really mean um, the politician's household uh, is about 38 uh, times wealthier. And then there are some politicians that are almost 200 times wealthier. Um, and so the sort of five Asian countries set out, and this is in part because as probably all of you know, the uh, average household wealth um, in these countries is, is rather low. Um, but then, you know, one interesting thing in the top panel is to kind of compare the U.S. to some of the other countries that we have at the moment um, in the sample. And so what we can see is that, that kind of this well-known fact that the uh, U.S. politicians um, are really wealthy and much wealthier than the population is not that much of an outlier, right? There are other countries that are, you know, that where sort of this kind of representational inequality by wealth is, is equally stark, but there are also a bunch of countries where where this wealth, um, um, you know, misrepresentation of wealth uh, is less stark um, than the United States. And so one of the things that we're going to do in this project is kind of do a lot more of this descriptive work to kind of get a sense of, uh, of how much variation there is um, across the world. Now, what we want to focus on here is, uh, again, to sort of look at the relationship between campaign finance rules um, and uh, and politician wealth. And so to classify countries in terms of their campaign finance systems, we rely on a database called the International IDEA uh, database, which is uh, a database on uh, basically de jure uh, regulation on campaign finance across the entire world. This is an incredible uh, effort to, uh, to collect sort of, um, um, kind of laws on the books uh, for basically all, you know, every country in the world. And so for now, what we're gonna focus on is just provisions for spending. So we're going to ignore, you know, campaign finance systems are complex. You know, usually they involve regulations on things like how much you can advertise on what kind of media for how long, um, you know, whether there's corporate contributions or contributions from into private individuals, um, you know, whether there's public financing or campaigns and parties and so on. But, you know, the, you know one of the crucial aspects of, of these uh, regulations is how much you can spend. Um, and so that's what we're going to focus on. And so we're going to, you know, we're going to use a very simple classification, at least for the purposes of this global analysis, where we're going to assume we're going to um, say that countries have stricter rules if there are clear caps on both party and candidate spending, and there's no ability to sell finance. So those are going to be strict, uh, with what we're going to call strict campaign finance rules, at least campaign spending rules. And then the permissive rules are simply the absence of either or both uh, of those. Um, uh, of those um, provisions. And so um, this is kind of a division uh, in these two camps uh, based on the countries that we have uh, at the moment um, in the data. And so you're not going to be surprised to see that the US is in the permissive camp. And this is because there's both ability to sell finance and also there is no clear uh, cap. Now, the reason why there's no clear cap is because you have things like you know dark money uh, and you also have variation in individual uh, in the amount that individuals can, uh, can spend based on, based on certain provisions. And so to the extent that those types of uh, provisions are not in the law or there are sort of clear prescriptions for, for the amount of spending, we would, uh, we would consider a country uh, to have a strict rule. Now, one thing that I really want to emphasize here, and again, this is something that might, might come up in, uh, you know, in Q&A or, or in the comments, is that there are certainly, there are certainly variation across countries in terms of what's on the books and what's actually happening um, you know, in reality. So the famous case is India, which has a pretty strict uh, system on the books, but then it's widely ignored uh, and you know, these provisions are, uh, are violated in practice. And so you know, people um, um, don't report a lot of um, uh, campaign contributions. A lot of them are under the table and many of them are illegal. Um, right? and so, um, um, so there's definitely kind of a slippage between the actual uh, rules and what, uh, you know, the visual and the de facto rules. Now, we're also working on kind of trying to incorporate uh, that distinction to, uh, to make this analysis uh, more precise uh, and clear. But for the time being, we're not. Right? And so, so again, uh, another grain of salt to, uh, to add to the interpretation of the results. Okay, so based on these, uh, you know, classifications and on the data, this graph is just descriptively showing this same ratio of politician wealth to average household wealth that I've shown earlier by country. Now we're showing it by, uh, by regime. 
And so what we're seeing, what we see at least in this descriptive, you know, very simple descriptive um, analysis is that it seems that the uh, ratios, so basically how well, how much wealthier politicians are in um, in those regimes with, or those countries with permissive regimes seems to be a lot higher, considerably higher than in, um, in countries with, uh, with strict regimes. Obviously, this is just, you know, descriptive um, correlation or correlation analysis, but it does suggest uh, that the possibility uh, of a correlation or relationship is there. And so to kind of make this a little bit more rigorous, this table is showing um, the regression results um, correlating um, the permissive and suspending rules with the ratio of politicians, and then including a lot of other sort of trying to hold constant uh, a number of other characteristics of countries that may correlate both with the uh, spending rules uh, and uh, the other wealth politicians. Now, I want to be clear here, we're not trying to say that we're trying to isolate causality here. So we're not going to claim based on this evidence that, you know, having a more or less permissive a uh, set of spending rules causes more or less wealthy uh, political elites, but we're trying to see whether the correlation holds up as we start adding other characteristics of countries. And so what we see is that as, you know, in the, as, as I've circled in the, um, um, in the, in red, um, as we kind of add additional um, um, characteristics of countries, we seem to see that the correlation, you know, remains relatively stable and relatively statistically precise um, in, in, in you know, in other words, there's a statistically significant um, correlation uh, between, um, you know, uh, permission of suspending rules and politician wealth. Now, the last column here, you might be wondering why is the last column completely empty? And so this is because here we're using what's called the lasso regression, which is, um, I'm not going to go into details, but this is a kind of a, a machine learning algorithm where the regression itself tries to pick um, other um, control variables that uh, are highly predictive uh, of politician wealth while still trying to estimate the correlation of the suspended rules. And even so, in this kind of agnostic and flexible approach, we seem to find the correlation to, uh, to be holding. So there might be something there, but you know, the, uh, this analysis alone cannot, uh, cannot tell us exactly um, whether there is a relationship or not. And so for that reason, to kind of try and, uh, you know, um, you know, go around the uh, the challenges in cross national um, data. What we also are doing, and I'm going to talk about for kind of the rest of the talk here, is uh, evidence from two case studies uh, of basically reforms in campaign finance um, uh, regulations that were done in a way that kind of can potentially help us uncover causal relationships. And so the first case study is the case study of Brazil, and the second case study is the case study of Chile. And so I'm going to talk about Brazil now, and then. Uh, if there is enough time, uh, I will I will talk about evidence from uh, from Chile. And so, as many of you probably know, Brazil, along with Chile and um, uh, basically all the other countries in Latin America, were in 2014 and 2013 swept by this humongous uh, corruption scandal, which is also a sort of topic near and dear to my heart. Um, which was basically um, so the Lava Jato um, scandal and its, its kind of um, um, you know related scandals, which basically was about uh, private and semi-private and public companies uh, funneling illegal campaign contributions to politicians at very high levels in many countries in exchange for, um, you know, preferential um, contracts, uh, monopoly positions, and so on and so forth. The kind of usual, you know, uh, you know high-level political corruption um, um, that, uh, that we tend to encounter. And so in response to that scandal, Brazil and Chile as well, as we will talk about later, enacted a reform of, of a campaign finance uh, system reform because the, you know, what was kind of perceived as the key feature of the scandal was that the uh, campaign finance system was simply not effective at preventing uh, political corruption in the form of uh, exchange of political contributions for, uh, for sort of goods one, or one way or the other. And so this reform was kind of a pretty sprawling effort. It included a lot of different things. Uh, one of which, which we are going to focus on, is the lowering of spending caps. So basically, across the board, there was a lowering of how much money can be spent in politics. There was also a ban on corporate contributions, so corporations could not um, uh, contribute anymore. There was a change in advertising regulations in terms of how much airtime and you know on what stations and what type of media and so on. And there was also an increase in, in public funding of parties. Now, the reason why we're going to focus on the lowering of spending caps is because it's going to give us a way to try um, and analyze the relationship between campaign finance rules and, and uh, the wealth of politicians' costs. And so how are we going to do that? 
So we're going to focus on not, you know, all the politicians or all the elections um, or all the campaign finance um, channels. We're going to focus on a very particular context. And so we're going to focus on local council elections. So these are elections for local legislatures. And so there's about five and a half thousand um, municipalities um, in Brazil. Um, and we're going to focus on councils that are about there are 17 uh, council persons or less. So we're talking about very small places, but we'll, I'll explain in a second why those small places are actually uh, actually useful. And so we have a universe of about 370,000 candidates. We have wealth for all of them, and we have um, um, information on uh, the cap in spending uh, for their particular uh, races. And so where we're going to exploit a particular feature of the reform is in the, the way that the spending cap was enacted. And so the spending cap for these elections was set at about at 10,000 reals, Brazilian reals, which is at the time was about $3,000, or 70% of the highest spending candidate in the previous municipal election, which was in 2012. So remember, this is the reform was enacted in 2015. Uh, the, the highest spending candidates were taken from 2012. And so what this does is this basically creates kind of a king. So up until here, it's 10,000 reais or 3,000 uh, US dollars. And then since, uh, you know, from then on, it's 70% um, of the highest spending candidate in 2012. And to the extent that there's a linear increase in spending, which more or less is in the data, you have kind of a linear increase in the cap. So there's kind of a you know, crack here that we're going to uh, um, use. But not only do we have a crack, but there's an interesting thing in the data where below the cap, so at 10,000 reals or less, the rate, the inflation rate that was used to kind of adjust the, um, uh, the cap was the inflation rate since the enactment of the law, which was in 2015, which was an uh, inflation rate of 8%. So uh, uh, you know, high, but, uh, but not so high. But because on the right-hand side of this king, you know, the, the cap was based on the 2012 spending, the inflation rate that was used to adjust the cap was the rate since 2012, which is about 33%. And so there were differential rates. And so what that induced is what you see in this left-hand side graph, which is not just a kink, but what we call a discontinuity. And so you have this, you know, the sort of fixed cap, and then you have a jump because of the inflation rates, and then you have a kink uh, going uh, further because of this 70% um, this uh, uh, cap. Okay. And so that's the discontinuity that we're going to use. So on the right-hand side, what you see is the actual data, which suggests that most of uh, the candidates uh, in these elections observed the, um, uh, the cap. Now, you might be wondering, why are they docked above the, uh, the actual caps? And this is because the law allowed uh, basically non-compliance. But then if you spend above the cap, then you would, uh, you would be you know, issued a fine, which was essentially 100% tax. So for every real that you spend above the cap, you would pay another real fine uh, for having uh, done so. And by the way, you're not going to be surprised that those who have breached the cap are very wealthy. So they're much wealthier than those who observed uh, the cap. And so the reason why this discontinuity is useful for us, because what we can do is we can perform what is called a regression discontinuity design, or in, you know, use a regression discontinuity design. So I assume that many in the audience know this, what this technique is, but I also imagine that some don't, and so I'm going to sort of briefly explain it. So basically, what we can assume is that the municipality is very close to this discontinuity. On both sides of the discontinuity should be very similar to each other. So whether you are, you know, a you're in your municipality where, where uh, the cap is 10,000, or whether it's you know just above the, the 10,000 real um, uh, cap, you know these these municipalities on average should be quite similar to each other, but they differ in one respect substantially, which is the cap itself. Now, what's interesting here is that the cap was kind of arbitrarily set, right? It was set with this arbitrary 10,000 cutoff, and then the usage of these two differential inflation rates. And so that is in sort of the parlance of you know econometric. Um, uh, approach is basically that we have a, a cap or a discontinuity in the cap that it's set exogenously, meaning that it's not being influenced by the wealthy politicians themselves or some other aspect of politics. And so this should allow us kind of leverage to be able to estimate the causal effect of difference in the cap. So what we're going to do in the rest of analysis for Brazil is we're going to compare municipalities that are just above the cap, which now they have a higher cap, to municipalities just below the cap or just below the discontinuity that have a lower um, cap on spending. So we're going to see how the 
um, the outcomes in terms of the wealth of politicians and their ability to win differs across these two sets of um, um, dysfunctions. And so the bulk of our analysis for this Brazilian case looks at how likely are politicians who ran in 2012 to win in 2016 now that the cap has been introduced or a differential cap has been introduced. And we're going to separately estimate this for rich candidates and for wealthy candidates and poor candidates. And in particular, what we mean is candidates that are in the kind of upper crust of the distribution, so the 75th percentile and above, versus the politicians in the, in, in the lower crust of the distribution of wealth, so the 25th uh, percentile and below. So in other words, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, if you're in a municipality with a higher spending cap and you're wealthy, is that advantaging you in terms of winning the seat than if you're less wealthy? compared to the same comparison in uh, municipalities where the cap is lower. So how, and, uh, to put it in another way, how much does a higher cap in spending advantage wealthy politicians, be it incumbents or challengers, in higher spending caps relative to, uh, to lower, uh, lower spending cap municipalities? I hope this is clear. If not, uh, you know, uh, you're welcome to, uh, to stop me and, uh, and ask me two questions. And so here, here are the results. Um, so the results, the sort of coefficients here, which uh, are numbers above those in the parentheses, are showing really the effect of being in the higher cap municipality close to that uh, discontinuity for rich incumbents. So that's the first column relative to, um, you know, how, light, how, more, how much more likely they are to win in higher cap municipalities than in low uh, cap municipalities. Uh, and the same for poor incumbents and then the same for rich challengers, poor challengers. And then the last set of columns is what we call competitive challengers. So not all the challengers are really serious candidates. Many of them don't get almost any votes. Um, many of them don't spend almost any money on campaigns. And so in the last set of columns, we focus on those uh, candidates, those challengers who are competitive in the sense that they're getting, uh, you know, a fair share, uh, you know, some, some uh, relatively large uh, share of the votes. And so what we, sh what we see here in this table is essentially that we don't see any difference for incumbents. So wealthier incumbents are no more likely to win or lose than less wealthy incumbents in higher uh, cap municipalities than in lower cap municipalities. But that's not what we see for challengers. So challenge, the richer challengers or wealthier challengers are more likely to win in places where there's more money to be spent than in places where there isn't. And so that's the case both for challengers overall and then particularly for competitive, uh, competitive challengers. Now, we have used a set of candidates who ran in 2012. So they were contesting elections before the reform, and now we're looking what happens to them after reform. So not all of them actually run again in 2016. So this previous table is showing you the probability of winning irrespective of whether they ran or not. But we can also look at whether they decided to run. And so long story short, what we're seeing here is that Poor challengers are the ones who are less likely to run in 2016 compared to what, you know, running in 2012 in places where there's more money to be spent. So basically having more money in elections seems to disincentivize poor challengers from running. Not so much or not really for incumbents, but for challengers. Okay? And then when we take into account whether somebody ran or not, when we look at their probability of winning, what we see, which is consistent with the previous um, uh, findings in the previous two tables, is that it is the rich challengers who are essentially winning, um, who are more likely to win in places where you, where you can spend uh, more money, um, conditional on having won. Right? So these are the ones that seem to be advantaged uh, by, uh, by you know, uh, more permissive um, uh, campaign finance rules. Okay? At least in you know local elections, uh, local legislative elections in Brazil. Okay, so that that was evidence from Brazil, and again, there's sort of a number of uh, things we can discuss about them, uh, but at least um, um, you know, um, kind of a you know big picture uh, result uh, for now. And so, in order to kind of try and see whether this holds up in another context, we um, used another case study, and this is a case study of Chile. Which had kind of a similar process. Um, there was a you know large camp, you know a corruption scandal, which um, uh, precipitated uh, changes in the campaign finance uh, rules, which were relatively similar to the changes in in the Brazilian uh, in the Brazilian context, and they were happening more or less around the same time. But what kind of gives us leverage in Chile um, that we didn't get in Brazil and vice versa is that at the same time what was happening was electoral reform uh, in Chile. And so there was an increase in the number of members of the lower house um, uh, deputies in the, um, the lower house um, of the Chilean parliament. 
Uh, and there was an increase, um, there was a decrease in the number of districts. So the districts became larger. At the same time, there was also an uh, increase in the number of people elected. And so what that led to is the increase in the district magnitude. So district magnitude is really just how many people, how many uh, representatives are elected from one uh, district. And so that went from two to between three and eight. So some districts quadrupled the, uh, the number of uh, people elected. And so the reason why these two um, reforms combined are helpful is because what happened as a consequence is that not only did the spending cap change, but the spending cap per candidate per seat or per voter per seat changed. So how much you can spend for a seat changed because the district magnitude changed. And what was happening with the change in the campaign finance rules is that some districts got a lot more money to spend and some districts had less money to spend depending on how much they increased in size relative to the pre-reform. And so the com combination of these two uh, reforms give us some leverage to again, try to get at the causal effect um, of, uh, of the change in campaign finance. And so this graph shows you the kind of the distribution of the percent increase in spending cap per vote per seat in a district across different districts. And so as you can see, there is some districts you had a decrease in the amount of money you can spend. And then in you know, a fair number of districts, you had actually an increase in the amount of money you can spend, but unevenly so. So we're going to use this variation to try and see whether in districts where the amount of money per voter per seat you can spend, if it's greater, how that affects uh, the uh, ability of wealthier or less wealthy uh, candidates to win. So this is pretty much the same type of analysis as we did um, in, in Brazil. And so this is really just briefly descriptively what, um, uh, what the data suggests. And so we've divided the district into kind of those where the increase in spending was either negative, meaning that there was less money to be spent, or relatively moderate, which is on the left-hand side, or where the increase in amount of money that you can spend per seat has actually gone quite a bit up, which is on the right-hand side. Okay. And so what we see, the, kind of the, the thing I want you to concentrate on is the difference between the blue line, which is the wealth of challengers among winners, among those who won, and the red line, which is the wealth of incumbents who won. So we're just focusing here on the winners. Okay? And so the immediate thing that I want you to see is that in, in districts where there's basically less money to be spent, what we see is that the winners among challengers tend to be considerably less wealthy than incumbents on average. And so these, these lines here are the densities, meaning they're just showing how many, uh, the wealth is on the x-axis, so how many um, candidates or how many winners here have what kind of wealth. And so the fact that this blue line extends to the left means that there are, many, you know, there are challengers who have lower wealth, but not incumbents. Okay? And so what we see is that challengers, the, you know, less wealthy challengers seem to be able to break through much more so in lower spending places than in higher spending places. Um, conversely, what seems to be happening in the higher spending places is that there are some challengers, again, the blue line, which is extending all the way to the right, whereas the incumbent, the red line, is not, suggesting that there are some challengers who are very wealthy who seem to be able to break through uh, in the higher spending places, which is a result that's reminiscent of what we've uh, seen in Brazil. Okay? And so this is just doing this more rigorously with uh, regression analysis, which is showing that um, so the left-hand side is both incumbents and, and all the challengers, and the right-hand side is just challengers, which is showing that as you increase the change, or there's a more and more money to be spent relative to the previous election, which is uh, the uh, values on the x-axis, what happens is that wealthier challengers are more likely to win, because this line, the main line in the graph, is the difference in the probability of winning for wealthy challengers and the less wealthy challengers. So wealthy challengers are being advantaged uh, over less wealthy challengers. And so it seems that the data or the, the evidence from both Brazil and Chile is suggesting that the way that more permissive rules seem to affect the wealth of the elite is not so much to incumbents, who seem to be you know, pretty unaffected, but through challengers in the sense that it's the wealthy challengers who are advantaged uh, by, uh, by these rules, at least in Brazil um, and, uh, and, and Chile. And so... What we think is the overall effect here when we see something like a reform is that the wealth of the elite is not going to go down. In fact, it might actually go up. And it's through kind of replenishment of the elite by uh, particularly wealthy, uh, wealthy challengers who are particularly advantaged uh, by those types of rules. Okay. And so 
based on all of this evidence, we are at least a bit more inclined than we were before we conducted all of these analyses to conclude that there is potentially a relationship between spending goals of the wealth um, of uh, winning candidates or the wealth of the, the politicians in power. And so what we hope to do, you know, in the subsequent iterations of this paper and in the project more generally is to, you know, sort of see a bit more about the challengers, get a little bit more description uh, of what is going on more generally in the world, uh, look at different types of campaign finance rules to see um, not just the spending caps, uh, but also look at um, the effect of other uh, types of rules like public spending on campaigns. And then more broadly, we want to sort of, sort of contribute more evidence as to whether it matters uh, whether politicians are wealthy um, or not. So what kind of policies they enact, uh, how does that uh, affect um, things like inequality and levels of redistribution uh, in the world. All right, so that's, that's pretty much what, uh, what we have. Um, and we very much look forward to um, the comments from Nina and Tim and uh, questions from the audience. All right, well, thank you, Marco. Uh, that was fascinating. And I think we will turn to Nina first uh, and then Tim after that. And then we'll give Marco some time to respond uh, and then we'll open to general questions. So Nina, take it away. All right, um, let me quickly pull up the slides that I put together and there we go. Okay, um, so first I wanna say thank you so much to Tim who invited me to participate and to everybody involved in organizing this series. And I wanted to thank Marco and your co and your co-authors, um, Lucia Motolini and Simon Wexler. Um, this was a really, really interesting paper to read and I learned an awful lot in the process of it. Um, I have some background in thinking about the effects of um, elite linkages, thinking more about the, um, more about the potential effects of corporate political linkages through through boards. So I found this this whole paper really interesting coming at um, coming at the effects of elites in a slightly different way. Um, so the challenge the paper addresses begins with the um, sort of horrible <laughs> or I don't know the, the really striking details about the wealth composition of the Trump administration um, and the increasingly wealthy profile of the US Congress um, and, and asks the question about how campaign finance laws, strict versus lenient or more permissive, can have an impact on the overall wealth of politicians relative to the overall population. And asks if deregulation of campaign finance laws or really more in the opposite direction, does strengthening campaign finance laws um, lessen this tendency towards, um, towards wealth representation in politics. And what I really appreciated was the balance of um, the balance of analyses. I really enjoyed the contrast between the broad um, the broad cross country analysis, looking at politicians' asset holdings and politicians' wealth, and also the comparisons in strict versus more permissive campaign finance laws. And then the Brazilian and Chilean cases were really really interesting case studies about how this may work out at the municipal city level. So um, it's starting off with a really, really interesting and rich set of data and also really interesting and relevant questions. And what's, you know, what, what's reaffirming is that it does seem that campaign finance rules appear to matter. Um, stricter, I, I, found the, um, I found the figure comparing um, in a, in a very blunt way, strict campaign finance laws and permissive campaign finance laws with wealth distributions of candidates in that win office to be a really striking evidence of the fact that laws can make a difference in this. Um, and the specific employment in particular cases really does illustrate how changing laws can make a difference. And I also found the, um, comparison of challengers experiences with incumbents experiences to be interesting for reasons that I'll delve into in a moment in some of my questions. So before jumping into my questions, I just wanna say it's quite possible that um, 
<laughs> this is tapping into supplemental work that the authors are doing. So um, take these in the broadest, take these in the broadest sense. Um, this is a, a, these are two photos of two quite wealthy politicians. Um, we have Franklin Delano Roosevelt on one side and Olaf Palma on the other side. And so I'm totally cherry picking here. But these are two examples of people who came from very wealthy backgrounds, very comfortable, um, very comfortable wealthy families who were broadly despised for the um, redistributive policies that they implemented or attempted to implement. So again, given that this is a really cherry picked example, um, I'm, I'm curious if, um, I, I would love to hear more about the specific rationale for why richer politicians should lead to more unequal outcomes. And I should step back to say, I'm completely in sympathy with this alignment. Um, as I mentioned, I tend to assume that when elites are more broadly represented in political um, bodies, that it will broadly tend to benefit wealthy interests. But when we think about the um, when we think about the the challenges of participating in the political fray, particularly in countries that have more permissive campaign finance laws, um, if if one wants a particular set of parties to win, does that change the um, does that change the acceptability of money in politics depending on who's running and whose values we actually want to see in power and so on. So um, while the authors have some comments at the very start of the paper saying, you know, the literature tends to show that wealthier interests tend to, um, tend to target high income interests once they are in office, some more detail about that or something in an appendix or or just some comments about your work in this line going forward i i would really appreciate hearing more on that another question i had is that the, the hook of the paper is these high level political candidates um the trump administration um for example um but the paper it tends to be examining more municipal level data so i'm curious if there are differences in the trends and their implications depending on the level of governance so um in a, in a country that has more permissive or, or stricter laws do we tend to see um stronger effects at the municipal level versus the national level and again um you're working with the data that you have. So again, I'm curious how, how this may be figuring into this work or into future work you guys are doing. Um, the second set of questions I have is methodological. Um, and you you touched a bit on this in your description of how you how you econometrically invested the, the discontinuity in the Brazilian case. Um, but I'm curious in the earlier data, um, if there are any apparent trends in the relative wealth of candidates over time, um, globally, but also at the country level. So um, are there unit roots in the wealth distribution of candidates over time? Because if there is a, if there are trends, um, if there are trends or if there are structural breaks, you know, a country implements um, a campaign finance regulation halfway through the time that you have access to their asset data, does that dramatically change the representation of different um, income groups in the in the candidates and in the ultimate campaign winners? Um, and again, this is this is just because it could present a potential source of bias in econometric analyses. Um, and my guess is that you are thinking about this in the background. Um, and to, to wrap it up, um, again, this is, this is cherry picking, but what I found really striking looking at the examples of countries that have stricter, um, stricter campaign finance laws versus more lenient campaign finance laws, um, was first of all that Italy, um, Italy, Chile, and South Korea are in the stricter campaign finance law areas. And so again, I'm, I'm curious about the timing of these regulations. I could immediately think of anecdotes of rich and problematic candidates um, winning office. We could think about Silvio Berlusconi in the Italian case, but we can also think about political dynasties 
winning and re-winning office. And I'm here, I'm thinking of Sebastián Piñera in Chile and Park geun in South Korea. So these are the, um, these are the offspring of people who held power decades in decades past, who win office, um, who may cycle in and out. Um, and again, this is, in, this is in countries that have these stricter finance laws. These are also national level politicians. So the calculus may simply be different. But I'm curious again about um, how we can disentangle the effects of wealth and ubiquity of particular candidates. Because my guess is that there's a strong correlation between wealthier candidates who can afford greater, um, who can afford greater advertising, but, but who also may simply be more known as entities before going in, before entering the political fray. I mean, I can think back to the Democratic primaries where the CEO or the former CEO of Starbucks Runs for runs for the Democratic primary or threatens to run for the de Democratic primary simply because he is a known agent and um, and has some has some sway because he's he's a well known figure. So how can we disentangle the correlation between fame, campaign spending, and political visibility or ubiquity of particular candidates? independent of their actual wealth holding and the implications that that may have for politics. And the way you're investigating these effects for incumbents and challengers, I think is a really interesting way you're beginning to tackle this. So I will, I will stop there. Excellent. Thank you, Nina. Uh, then I think we will go over to Tim Schenk. Tim, take it away. Great. Uh, thanks, Trevor. And I'll thank for organizing this. Also, Kyle, for the work you put into this and Marco for sharing this excellent research with us. Um, just so everyone knows, no PowerPoint for me, just text. So my screen will say private. Um, all right. So in reading Marco's paper, I was reminded of why the ancient Greeks believed that democracies should choose office holders by lottery, not by popular vote. According to this Greek version of democracy, the system was supposed to empower, to like open up power equally to all. And their concern was that elections would just give the wealthy a chance to buy their way into office. You know, some 2000, later, 2000 years later, we can see from Marco's paper that it looks like the Greeks were onto something. And for purposes of our conversation today, I'm just gonna stipulate that his findings are sound. Um, empirically, they certainly look that way to me. And as a fairly conventional historian, I'm in no way qualified to challenge them. What I'd like to do instead is to think about how these results fit into the history I'm most familiar with, uh, namely the United States, with the goal of getting a firmer grasp of how money shapes elections. I think that's especially worth doing because paradoxically, in our time of increasing economic inequality, there's reason to believe that money is losing some of its influence on campaigns, at least in the United States. To be clear, money has always been a part of American democracy, dating back to the 18th century, when candidates used offers of free beer to draw voters to the polls. But there are two moments when the way money was used changed dramatically. First, in the Gilded Age, when an industrialized economy made it possible to run national campaigns on a scale not previously imaginable. The second moment, and the more important for our purposes, took place in the 1970s, when the business community launched a new wave of mobilization in response to falling profits and increasing regulations, pouring money into lobbying, public relations, and campaigns. This took place at the same time that the cost of campaigning was soaring, thanks to the twin rise of television advertising and the emergence of an increasingly professionalized class of political consultants. The ironic thing is that in 1974, right before the importance of money was about to skyrocket, Congress had passed the most stringent campaign finance laws in American history, placing limits on donations and expenditures and establishing a central enforcement agency, the Federal Election Commission. This was the first time, at least in American history, that any sort of campaign finance system had real teeth to it but structural imperatives outweighed this new regulatory infrastructure. Business mobilization, TV spending, and the consultant class. Those were the real influencers in the new system. The key point here was that spending could reliably boost a candidate's performance, most of all in local races, where the simple fact of name ID, having heard of a candidate on television, was a huge advantage. As I mentioned above though, there are signs that this system is starting to give way, that money is losing its punch. And this matters for Marco's argument, because if more campaign spending doesn't translate as readily into victory at the polls, 
it raises the possibility that in the future, a candidate's wealth could be less of a factor than say their number of Twitter followers. In that case, that political celebrity might outweigh plutocracy. And here, I think I'm working in a path that, or following Nina down a path that she was already suggesting. But let me go further. So in the United States, at least, as politics becomes more and more nationalized, split ticket voting has declined. So which party you support for the White House increasingly dictates who you support down ballot. And because presidential elections are covered so extensively, advertising delivers less bang for the puck for the buck. Not only did Donald Trump spend far less than Hillary Clinton in 2016, he spent less in the entire campaign than Mike Bloomberg did just in the 2020 Democratic primary. 600 million for Trump and the general like Republican supporting apparatus in 2016 versus a billion dollars for Bloomberg in 2020. It's also fascinating to think of how Trump, the billionaire who hated financing his own campaign and did it as little as possible, might fit into Marco's framework. Although there are a lot of idiosyncrasies, idiosyncrasies there and that guy gets enough attention already. So feel no need. I'm not at all suggesting that you actually have to mention him in the paper. Um, but you could see a similar dynamic at work across the country in 2020. In South Carolina, for instance, Democratic Senate candidate Jamie Harrison outspent Republican Lindsey Graham by almost a third, only to lose in a landslide. And that same story played out in Kentucky, where Democrat Amy McGrath again outspent a Republican incumbent, in this, in this case, Mitch McConnell, by a third, only to lose to a walk. In addition to illustrating the limits of how much campaign spending can buy you, those two stories also show an important shift in how money is raised, namely the ascent of small dollar donors, comfortable but not uber wealthy, who treat politics as a hobby with MSNBC or Fox News as their ESPN, and who are much more likely to donate to an out-of-state candidate like a McGrath or, or a Harrison, who they find attractive for other purposes, than to consider donating to a candidate in their own backyard. Or think of the 2020 Democratic presidential primary, where Joe Biden easily won despite being outspent by the aforementioned Mike Bloomberg and also Bernie Sanders, another candidate powered by small, by small donors, or Pete Buttigieg, who used extensive meritocratic connections to break into elite donor networks, even though he was the only major candidate for the Democratic nomination who wasn't a millionaire or a billionaire, which is another interesting wrinkle from Marco's argument. Think of it as the Buttigieg loophole. So what's the moral of all this? Well, by way of conclusion, I just want to emphasize again, it's not that money is relevant. National campaigns are a world unto themselves. And the farther away you get from the media spotlight, the more important campaign spending becomes. But I do think it raises important points about the conditions that turn money into an effective campaign tool. And it also suggests that confronting the problem of inequality requires facing up to some vexing questions about democracy itself. All right, that's all for me. I'll hand it back to Marco now. Excellent, thank you, Tim. Um, all right, Marco, then uh, it's back to you if you want to respond to any and all of the points raised there, and then we'll open it up to general questions. Um, yeah, so, I mean, thank you, Nina and Tim. These are, these are excellent comments, um, both in terms of you know, stuff to think about within the paper itself, and then uh, things to think about more broadly. Um, and so I, I don't, you know, I, I'd love to hear more questions and comments. And so um, I, I won't spend um, too much time responding to each. Um, we, in fact, if anything, I would want to kind of add a few things that kind of give us pause, uh, especially in the American context, and sort of something that we want to kind of, you know, look at uh, more broadly in the project. And I think that will inform uh, this paper um, as well. So, you know, you know, one thing that kind of in line with what Tim mentioned is that, you know, what's happened over the last two or three campaign cycles in the United States is that there has basically been a flip in terms of the types of contributions that Democrats get versus the Republicans. So the Republicans, you know, classically have been a party of big business, and you know, we're mostly being, um, you know, we're we're getting donations from, uh, from from corporations, or at least we're kind of leading in that category. And that has actually flipped. So the biggest donors, like you know, I think 16 of the 25 biggest donors uh, in the past two election cycles have been, uh, the you know, on the Democratic Party side. And the average uh, contribution for uh, Republican candidates has been substantially smaller um, than than for uh, for the Democrats. So, um, and so, uh, you know, there's something going on there which is which is kind of weird, right? So, one thing that, for example, we want to do in the international, like in cross national context, is to look at left parties and what has been happening to them, right? Uh, as opposed to right parties more broadly. So, for example, what we've seen, we have some data from Sweden, which we haven't shown in this paper. Where basically, if you look at kind of the wealth of politicians in 
parties that are kind of demo, social, social democratic uh, parties, they're no less wealthy. In fact, sometimes they're wealthier on average than, um, than members of uh, parties that are kind of traditionally considered on the right that are kind of friendlier to business interests. And that's not necessarily to say that, you know, the social democratic parties pretend to be the parties of the, of the less wealthy, but there's also like, there's potentially some tension there that, uh, that needs, uh, that needs a little bit more scrutiny. And now, one other thing that's happening in the United States as well as elsewhere is that there is increasing educational polarization where parties on the left are represented by people who are more, um, you know, coming from uh, more highly educated backgrounds. And there's a strong correlation between education and wealth. Um, and so, you know, that's also something. And so to, to Nina's point, you know, the you know, FDR or all of Palme, right, that they were highly educated and coming from sort of a line of kind of, you know, sort of, you know, uh, from, from a background where they were holding preferences, you know, in, you know, they're not inimical to the, to the kind of left interests, right, but they were not coming from that type of background. They were not blue collar um, workers and so on. Right? And so these are, these are all kind of part of the same, you know, bigger kind of more complex uh, and somewhat perplexing uh, pattern that uh, that are not fitting neatly into it's sort of the, the story that the paper that you saw is, uh, is trying to as well. So I definitely acknowledge that uh, these are types of uh, that can get uh, quite answered. Okay, well then I think we will open it up to general questions, comments, reactions, objections, animadversions, anything else from the audience. Um, and I think I will use my, uh, my vast powers and prerogatives to put myself at the front of the queue uh, while everyone thinks about this. And just to pick up Marco on your last point, I mean, I can, I can sort of imagine that there are tr two and again, this is this is a, a historian of early modern Europe trying to speak to contemporary democratic politics. So it's possible that everything I'm about to say is completely wrong, but um, it still seems like there's an intuition um, that you see, for instance, expressed in Thomas Piketty's work about the Brahmin left and the merchant right. You know, that's trying to capture a sense of an increasing cost of elections, while at the same time there's a kind of decreasing uh, participation and democratization, and whether you know we should think of the causal direction of that story as being um, we've undone campaign finance rules uh, in the way that you describe, and that means that we can safely drop out anybody who doesn't have money to contribute, um, and so politics becomes this kind of elite game that's split between different factions of one internal elite, or whether we can imagine that say. Uh, once uh, there is less democratic participation and oversight, then there's more opportunity to dismantle things like campaign finance rules. And I realize that you know that's a a hard question to unpack. But whether you you know, given that you're you're speaking from such a wider range of cases than I'm familiar with, whether you have some intuition in general, how if there's one of those stories or the other that seems more prevalent. Yeah, that's that's a great. That's a great question. Um, I mean, it's also a broader question. So I think I think the risk of kind of elites competing on both sides is very real. I mean, there's been repeated scholarship, which is pretty persuasive, that has shown that the you know there's a strong correlation between, for example, education and participation in politics, not just in the United States uh, but elsewhere. Right? Um, and so, you know, again, to the extent that education correlates with wealth, if we have you know Kind of wealthy politician, wealthy, you know, individuals uh, participating, whether by donating or whether by, um, you know, being more likely to vote, whether by being more likely to contact their representatives. Then ultimately, we're going to have basically selection bias, where a whole chunk of the population is really detached, right? Um, and and then it's just a you know competition between elites. Right? Um, and so I think. Campaign finance reforms are not very effective at dealing with this problem, at least not by themselves. Right. So trying to, I think that speaks to Tim's point. So trying to um, just limit the amount of money in and of itself is not going to, it's not going to, to help. In, in, if nothing else, because the people who are less engaged in politics, they're going to be focused on, you know, the sort of Twitter celebrities or the, or the, you know whatever, you know, reality show, apprentice, whatever, you know, candidates who they know have seen rather than sort of engaging in it. And so, you know, money in and of itself is not, uh, it's not going to be, um, uh, to be effective there. Right? Now, where, where I think money is 
or sort of uh, reforming the uh, the effect of money is I think um, you know research that I haven't mentioned but it's been very influential in the U.S. recently is kind of the role of parties as gatekeepers. Um, so what sort of tends to happen at the local level in the United States, what research has shown, is that when a when a you know poor candidate or a candidate with a kind of um, you know blue collar background is put forth as a candidate, party gatekeepers are less likely to to kind of pick that candidate um, up, right? And you know, and and not necessarily for any nefarious reasons, but because of the expectation that it's going to be harder to fundraise for those types of candidates, the kind of types of interests that are going to fund, you know, they're going to be on the table is is more limited and so on. Right? And so, kind of getting rid of that, you know, gatekeeping um, um, barrier, I think, is where the, um, the campaign finance reforms are, are the strongest. And so, so that's not on the kind of voter side for the sort of the set of non-elite. Uh, who are participating, but particularly a set of kind of elite and the particular parties. Now, at the same time, what's happened, for example, with Citizen United is increasing the, the strength and the power of independent, um, you know, the independent contributors has actually taken away power from the, the parties in a way where, as Tim said, money is becoming less important. Right? Um, and so there's also that where they're, you know, they're less able to be gatekeepers, both in the sense that they can pick up candidates who are not likely to fundraise proficiently, but they're also less able to prevent people who are able to proficiently fundraise in non, you know, traditional ways. Right? So it kind of cuts that's both ways. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I should have said uh, at the outset that if you have a question, you can either raise an electric hand or put something into the chat uh, to notify me. Um, and so as you're continuing to think about that, um, I see a question from James Foster, uh, one of the guiding hands of facing inequality and of IIEP in the chat asking, uh, democratic socialists, DSA, I assume, argue that both parties in the U.S. represent the same interests while working class interests go unrepresented. Do your results help us in interpreting this contention? Um, so, so not the results in this paper per se, uh, but I have done work in the U.S. And so one of the things that we have looked at with the wealth data that we collected is kind of a correlation between ideology, at least ex as expressed by members of Congress as they vote on various issues, and wealth. And so one interesting thing that we see is um, that the correlation between... so. In general, over the entire period for which we have the data, what we see is that wealthier members of Congress tend to be more economically conservative, which is not shocking, right? It's not surprising. And that's actually the case for both parties. So both the Democrats who are wealthier tend to be more conservative, and especially Republicans who are wealthier tend to be more conservative than less wealthy members in their own party. But what we've also seen in the last 10 years is that there is a bit of a breakdown in this correlation, and in particular among Democrats. And so wealthy Democrats in the last 10 years don't tend to be more economically conservative than the less wealthy Democrats, whereas that, that still holds for, uh, for Republicans. And so there has been a little bit of a, of a it's, there, there's still a bit of a correlation, but it's much, much weaker than, say, in the 70s or the, or, sorry, in the 80s or the 90s or the early 2000s. Um, and so I am, at the same time, you know, I've shown you a graph where both in, among Democrats and among Republicans, you have two thirds of members of the House who are millionaires, and basically everyone in the Senate is a millionaire. So there's a little bit of both. So there is, I think both parties are very wealthy and mainly representing or focusing on wealthy interests. Um, but there is a little less of that, I think, happening lately in the Democratic Party. And I think the reason is the polarization, right, where, you know, among other things, the wealthy Democrats are kind of they're very, you know, they're actually more on the left on a bunch of cultural issues than the, the median Democratic voter is. Um, uh, whereas on, on economic interests, they're, they're still relatively more conservative, but um, not as much as uh, they used to be. Now, I should also say one thing that I am in the planning phase of doing is kind of to see among Democrats how much of real commitment there is for something like tax reform. So we have we have heard things like you know the sort of calls for the wealth tax and so on. But then when the push comes to shove, would, would, would the Democrats really support that um, if, it, if it came up in the agenda? So this is something that I'm, I'm trying to do right now. And I, I must say, based on sort of the scholarship I've done so far, I'm not particularly optimistic that they would really be committed other than sort of um, that um, kind of restoratively. 
Okay, I see that uh, Nina has flagged that she has another question. So I'm going to go back to her. Okay, um, these are all really interesting. Um, your, your feedback is really interesting. Um, something I have been thinking about is that, I, I'm curious if you've, um, the, the, the relative parallels between having an elite, um, let's say an elite cultural background in terms of having a university education and having a high income has historically been quite correlated. But I'm curious if that, um, if that correlation is, is as strong as we may suspect it to be, because I, I think about the, um, you know, I think about the, um, the circular conversations about who, who should we consider to be high class, someone who has not gone to college, but has a successful business and someone who has gone to college and gotten a master's and works at a public library and has a relatively low income compared to the non-college educated person. So, um, I mean, I would be really curious comparing the US case because I, I, I don't know if that's a particularly prevalent thing in the US. I don't know if that relationship between economic elite status and high education is a, is a tighter correlation elsewhere in the world, but it would be something interesting to complicate. Um, it would seems like it would be an interesting complicating factor in all of this. Yeah, that's 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 a that's a great point. I um I don't know. So you know, one thing that's really really clear in the data in the U.S. is there's a pretty tight correlation between education and income in the general population. There's almost zero correlation among politicians, and this is because almost all of the members of the House or the Senate are highly educated. So you have very few uh, people who don't have um, a graduate degree, and they're all from you know the 1940s or the 30s, um, and they're sort of slowly you know exiting um, you know the House or the Senate one way or the other. And, um, and so, so it's it's not really possible to sort of talk about politicians per se. But what what I think you're getting at is like in general, like politicians are being drawn from the population, and what's happening in population. And so. I, I don't know. I haven't looked at the data, and I'm not. I haven't seen uh, others doing that. But that's that's really that's really an important question. I think one one thing I can say is one thing that's really stark in the United States when you look at the wealth um, is like in Congress, most and in general, how do how how do wealthy get wealthy in the United States? They get wealthy because they own financial wealth, right? They have stocks and bonds and so on, and then getting capital gains on that. And they're deferring the payment, as we you know recently heard. Um, you know, taxes because they're not really, you know, getting capital, you know, they're not selling stocks, right? They're, the assets are just appreciating. And, um, um, whereas in the population, there's very little financial wealth. So most of us, you know, own wealth based on our real estate um, and maybe something that we have inherited, right? We, you know, our, the, the median wealth in the United States is zero financial assets. Right? That is not the case abroad. So there are like the very wealthy politicians abroad own stocks, but the median politician owns a lot of real estate, um, a lot of land and so on, which is the kind of wealth, the kind of assets that uh, the, citizen, um, the citizens own. And so I wouldn't be surprised if the, this education and wealth correlation is different abroad because the type of wealth that's being um, owned is also different. So like, you know, you really need to have a good business, you know, a, you know, a high earning business to buy up real estate and land. Um, and you don't necessarily need education for that. Whereas here, you need to be a lawyer in order to, you know, to be able to afford, um, you know, stocks and bonds, right? Um, and, or, you know, or whatever, right? And so, and so that kind of, you know, boosts the correlation between education and uh, wealth. But that's just a supposition. I have, I have no clue if that's, if that's the case, but that could be one of the That, uh, as the, early modern historian that reminds me of prohibitions in 18th century France on the holders of venal offices being able to have mobile wealth as opposed to immobile wealth, uh, because there's a fear that mobile wealth would be corrosive to civic virtue because it could always leave and uh, be subject to the civic virtues of somewhere else. Um, that, as you'll recall in 18th century France did not end uh, very promisingly. Uh, so I see another question from Kyle Renner in the chat who asks, what can your research say about the type of electoral system and impact of wealth in elections? Is there a split between systems which have an open party runoffs like in the US and those in which parties put forward a slate? Uh, 
do elites seem to have greater access to electoral success in one or the other? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's actually something that we, I think, might at some point uh, try and, and evaluate, at least with the data that we have. So the, the kind of broad you know, classical findings are that proportional representation, so where, you know, where um, you know, people are not uh, elected in, say, single member districts or um, you know, are elected on party lists, tend to produce outcomes where, in terms of descriptive representation, uh, politicians are more um, kind of representative of their populations than of the types of uh, systems like the one in the US, where it's kind of a winner take all um, system. And so chances are that those types of findings might also extend to wealth. So if it's kind of winner take all and you are forced to make kind of you know tactical or strategic choices as to who is likely to win, then chances are given that the wealthy are more likely to you know to be nominated and to win in general that you're going to be um, you know more likely to uh, to bet on them uh, than you would in proportional representation where you know the kind of last guy on the list might um, might be you know just as likely to uh, to get in um, you know say parliament than than the first guy and there might not be a huge relationship in terms of wealth. But this has been untested and again partly because there's no there hasn't been uh, sort of systematic data on wealth um, and so we don't know. Now, the wrinkle is the kind of open versus closed list, uh, which exists in both the winner take all and the proportional representation systems. So to the extent that you have primaries, the question is who, who might be advantaged. And so there's, it can cut both ways as Tim uh, mentioned and, and Nina mentioned also um, uh, as well. So the, you know, these open primaries kind of, you have to advertise a lot. Right? And so in some, you know, it might be that you have to advertise with money, right, which I think is what we're sort of finding um, in, in Brazil and um, in Chile. But, you know, now with the advent of Twitter and so on, it might be that, um, that you know, it's kind of a more popularity context than a monetary contest. And so, um, so it, you know, money might not, that might matter. And so, so it might be kind of the, there's something in addition to the system itself, which is the sort of technology by which you, um, you manage to reach uh, voters and the types of voters, you know, to Trevor's point, and, uh, that, that might matter. So it might not be a super simple story, but I think that the kind of simplest explanation is that more proportional systems tend to um, be more descriptively representative, which is probably the case in so well as well. Okay, well, by my count, we have one minute left. So it might be possible to slide in one last question if there is still one lingering out there. Um, but hearing none, then I think I will gavel this meeting to its conclusion. Um, thank you all for joining us and thank you uh, Marco to our speaker and thank you Nina and Tim for your discussant duties. Um, I think this has been a very interesting and pr productive conversation. Um, so thanks to everyone and stay tuned for future events.